good afternoon everyone hope i'm audible so i will be covering couple of the presentations and uh, i give the choice to you to interact after the presentations or uh, after each presentation depending on how your attention span is so the first would be on cancer screening especially cancer prevention and women I'm going to concentrate on a couple of most important or common cancers which affect women. First will be the cervical cancer and second will be breast cancer. So, in this presentation you will learn about old and new methods of cervical cancer screening. It will help you take an active part in promoting health as well as educating your kith and kith. However, this is only an insight into what is actually needed and will not replace a visit to a doctor. So, as regards cancer screening, especially cervical cancer, you can prevent cervical cancer with screening. So, screening is a terminology which we have devised for the surge of diseases such as cancer in people who are not symptomatic. So, these are basically healthy people who do not have any symptoms but we were able to detect cancer at an early stage or even before it becomes cancer, what we call pre-cancer. We know that screening has saved thousands of lives. This is why we recommend that you get screened for cervical cancer on a regular basis. If we do so, cervical cancer can be prevented. So what is the burden of the disease? In the US, it is estimated that about 10,000 women will be diagnosed with cervical cancer and about 3,000 of them will die of the cancer itself. This is in a country where there is a robust cancer screening program where they do it every three years. But in a country like India, where cervical cancer is more rampant, there is no screening, and we detect far more cases of cervical cancer, and that too in a later stage, by which the mortality due to the cancer disease itself is very high. We are able to prevent this only by screening. So, what is the cervix? Cervix is one of the female organs. As you can see from the picture, the cervix actually is the lower part of the womb, which is known as the neck of the womb. This is what is visible to the gynecologist or the doctor who examines you, and we can pick out lesions which are tending to be abnormal due to either infection or precancerous lesion or an early stage cancer itself. So, the cancer of the female organ, namely the neck of the womb, is called the cervical cancer, the easiest female cancer to prevent through screening. What is a PAPS test? Many of you would have heard this test name either from your master health check or from magazines or the web. Basically, the cells are collected from the surface of the cervix by a doctor these cells are then checked under a microscope for any abnormalities. If abnormal or precancerous changes are found, then we can treat it before they become cancer. So cervical cancer can also be found in the early stages when it is easier to treat. So this is how we detect cervical cancer. The picture on the left shows how a normal cervical cell will look like. And the picture on the right shows how pre-cancer cells will look like. A pap test is not an internal examination. It is not a test for ovarian or uterine cancer. A biopsy or a procedure where a needle is used to remove cells to study is basically what it is. And it's also a test for sexually transmitted diseases. So most cervical cancer cannot can be prevented and it's very rare in women who get regular pap tests. So we need also need to understand what causes cervical cancer. The main cause of cervical cancer is infection with genital human papilloma virus. This is a particular type of virus which is called HPV. It is a virus that is spread by sex. You could have been infected with HPV years ago, but only recently found it on the test. There are many different types of HPV. And certain types are known as high risk because they cause changes in the cells on the cervix, which later on can become cervical cancer. So how common is HPV? 
most women and men who've had intercourse would have been exposed to HPV and most sexually active women, nearly about 80%, have been exposed to this virus by the age of 50. So how do you know if you're at risk for HPV? Anyone is at risk for HPV. And who is at higher risk for HPV? One who has more than one sexual partner or anybody's spouse or partner who has had multiple sexual partners are at higher risk for developing HPV. How will you know if you have HPV infection? You do a pap smear test and that if comes as abnormal with the suggestive suggestion that it could be because of HPV, you can detect it. We nowadays have what we call HPV DNA testing, which can identify whether you have a HPV infection due to a high risk type of a virus. So if you have HPV, does it mean you will get cancer? No. Most people get HPV infection, just like any other viral infection, but very few will go on to get cervical cancers. In most cases, HPV infection goes away on its own. It's similar to the influenza or the flu virus. Not everybody who gets the flu will end up having pneumonia. Many of them, the flu restricts itself and becomes all right on its own. In certain people, if it is a very virulent type, the flu virus can cause a pneumonia. Similar to that, most of the HPV infection can go away. Sometimes, if it does not go away for many years, this can cause the cervical cancer. Is it a sign of adultery? No, HPV is not a sign of unfaithfulness. It is not possible to know when you got the HPV. You may have had the HPV for many years before it's actually showing up. So who is at risk for cervical cancer? Women who do not have any pap test. Women who do not follow up with the testing or treatment after an abnormal pap test. Women who have had persistent HPV and women who smoke. Women who smoke are exposed to passive smoking on a regular basis. If they have a precancerous lesion on the cervix or a HPV infection, changes persist and they tend to develop cancer later on in their lifetime. So who is at risk of cervical cancer? Women with immune problems, HIV, transplanted organs, steroid medications, chemotherapy, and women whose mothers took the drug called DES. It's not useful now. It's been banned for quite nearly about 40, 50 years. How do I lower my risk of getting cervical cancer? You need to get regular pap tests and follow up if necessary. Limit the number of sexual partners. Do not smoke cigarettes. Keep a healthy diet and lifestyle. Use condoms consistently and correctly during sexual activity. What will a pap test tell you? It will tell whether the cells on your cervix are normal or abnormal or possibly cancerous. So how common are abnormal pap test results? They're quite common. They're usually only slightly abnormal. If followed up and treated early, you can prevent the abnormality from turning into a cervical cancer. When do you have to have your first pap test? No more than three years after your first sexual activity and no later than age 21. How often do you need a pap test? Every year until age 30. And after 30, if you've had only normal results, you may have them every two to three years, depending on the results. I usually recommend that for between the age of 21 and 65, you have it every three years. Why do you need to get tested? Just like mammogram, Pap testing is not a one-time test. The test is not perfect. New changes can happen, especially if you've recently acquired the HPV infection. It would take many years for changes to develop or to be noticed. And your risk changes if you have new partners or if your condition changes. Like, for example, you've had steroid medications or you've developed some other infections or had a transplant. This predisposes you to a higher risk of developing abnormal changes. So you need to keep repeating the pap test in spite of the fact you might have had her normal pap smear. When can I stop having pap smears? Around the age of 65 or 70 if you're not otherwise at higher risk for cervical cancer.
I feel fine, so why do I need a pap test would be a question. A pap test can find changes of the cervix. You might not have any symptoms or notice a problem, yet there can be an underlying precancerous lesion which can be safely picked up with a pap smear test. What can I do to make a pap test as accurate as possible? These are small tips to get a proper result so that you don't keep, need to keep repeating. Schedule your pap test when you're not having a period. Abstain from intercourse for about two days before the test. Do not do vaginal douching for about two days before the test. Do not use tampons, or jellies, or vaginal creams or medications for two days before the test. This tends to increase the yield of the pap smear cells and also give an accurate result as far as possible. What would you expect to have when you're having a pap test? You will be asked to lie on a special couch. Your feet may be placed in the stirrups or foot holders. You will have a speculum which is inserted into the vagina and opened so that the gynecologist can visualize the cervix or the neck of the womb. This is slightly uncomfortable, not too painful. And this allows your healthcare provider or doctor to see the cervix on the whole and take a smear from there. What should you expect when you have a pap test? It'll, you can expect a small brush or a cotton, switch, a cotton tip swab to drop and remove the cells from the cervix. They put it on a vial or a slide and you may have some spotting or light bleeding afterwards for a couple of days. You can have a copy to be mailed to you. You can call for your results. If you have an abnormal results, it's extremely important you show up for follow-up appointments and get the recommended testing and treatment. Even after a normal pap test, it's still important to report any symptoms of abnormal vaginal bleeding, discharge, or pain to your doctor. Do you need a pap test if you've had a hysterectomy for any other reason? If you had a hysterectomy for the treatment of pre-cancer or cancer of the cervix, you will still need a pap test till the doctor recommends at regular intervals. If the cervix was left in place at the time of your hysterectomy, a procedure what we call subtotal hysterectomy, you will still need pap smear test. Preventive health care is still important even if you do not need a pap test, so at least an examination would be useful. What is new in all the screening and prevention? Nowadays, we do liquid-based PAP. It's a combination of HPV testing and PAP tests for women 30 years of age and older. And we now have vaccines for HPV currently being tested and used as well. They are given in three doses, one, two, and six months dose, which prevents nearly about 70 to 80% of the cervical cancer. Women who've had the HPV infection, uh, HPV vaccination, still need to have the pap smear test done. HPV vaccination is not a substitute to pap smear. So what is the message I would like you to take home? Regular pap tests are the best way to prevent cervical cancer. If you get an abnormal pap smear result, does not mean you have cancer. It could well mean that you have a precancer or a condition which could be treated and prevented from it becoming a cancer. Getting a positive HPV test does not mean you have cancer. Getting a positive HPV test is not a sign of unfaithfulness. This means you're finding a potential problem now before it's too late. So I would urge one and every one of you to take, make an appointment to get a pap test done and also to recommend it very strongly to the people whom you know. Tell them about the importance of preventing cervical cancer reassure them it doesn't hurt, help them find the right doctor to get it done, get an appointment, and also help them around to make sure the scheduled appointment is kept up. We just move on to the next one, which is breast cancer, which is the most common form of cancer among women. At least in India, it's second to breast uh, cervical cancer, but nowadays, with the westernization and the change in the eating habits and increase in take of junk food, breast cancer is on the lead. And it is the second most common cause of cancer-related deaths. One in eight women tend to develop breast cancer, and one-third of the women with breast cancer die from breast cancer. No, no, cut to
so what are the risk factors aging if a first degree relative say a mother or sibling have had breast cancer you are at higher risk of developing breast cancer when there is an early onset of periods or delayed menopause there is a higher risk of breast cancer and the first childbirth has happened after the age of 30 or a person who's never breastfed the children they are at higher risk of developing breast cancer any hormones given extraneously especially in the form of hormone replacement treatment for a duration of more than five years the women are then exposed to higher risk of breast cancer and oral contraceptive pills on a regular basis for more than 10 years can increase the chances of developing breast cancer radiation exposure to the breast or any other breast disease overweight and increased fat in your diet and excessive consumption of alcohol can increase the risk of breast cancer and there are certain families where genetic predisposition due to the possession of the following genes predisposes the family to itself to have a higher risk of breast cancer the various stages of breast cancer the early stage is where a stage one which is less than about two centimeters with no nodes or no metastasis stage two is about two to five centimeters with some nodes present on the same side with no evidence of any distant spread stage three any tumor more than five centimeters which have the involvement of the glands on the same side and stage four if the cancer has spread beyond the breast the commonest area where the cancer can spread to is the bones liver and the brain so how do we screen and how can we detect breast cancer in an early stage to prevent death due to breast cancer this is a picture which will tell you the common structure and the anatomy of the breast So basically, the cancer happens between the skin and the underlying muscle in the subcutaneous fat tissue. So we need to know what is normal breast physiology and anatomy. Usually both breasts are symmetrical. There can be slight alteration in the size. The size varies due to the weight. If you're increasing in weight, the size increases due to the menstrual cycle because of the second half of the cycle due to water retention the breast can become bigger and during pregnancy and lactation and the shape and the texture can change with the age and especially with menopause so what are the abnormal signs and symptoms one looks for when examining the breast to detect early cancer or and pre-cancer lesion you look for what is called puckering of the skin the dimpling of the skin, similar to what happens on top of an orange fruit. Retraction of the nipple. The nipple is not in the same line with the other breast. Any abnormal discharge from the nipple in the form of a whitish pus-like discharge or blood. Thickening of the skin or lump or a knot which you can find in the skin. And a nipple which is pulled back, what we call an attracted ripple. Change in breast size, pain or tenderness, redness, change in nipple position, scaling or itching around the nipples and falling off of the skin and sore on the breast that does not heal. As a clinical examination is performed by a doctor annually for women over age of 40 and at least every three years for women between 20 and 40, more frequent examination for high risk patients. When I mean high risk patients, those women who are diabetic, who have blood pressure, who are overweight, who are on hormone replacement treatment, and who have a family history of breast cancer should visit the doctor on an annual basis to get breast examined as well as screening test done. So the most important screening technique is called the mammography. We do the X-ray of the breast. It's been shown to save lives in patients between 50 and 69 years of age. And normal mammogram does not quite rule out the possibility of cancer completely. If the mammogram is positive, there's a higher chance of one having cancer. 
So what are the important do's and don'ts? Avoid getting a mammogram done in the week before the period. Do not wear deodorant powder or cream. Bring a list of the places and dates of mammograms or biopsies if you have had before. Even before getting a mammogram done, best would be to do a breast self-examination. It's an opportunity for women to become familiar with the breast. It will be recommended to have a monthly exam of the breast and the underarm area, especially in the front of the mirror. And you might be able to discover any changes early, even before going to the doctor for an examination. Begin at the age of 20 and continue monthly doing it every time after a period. So when to do the breast self-examination? Menstruating women, five to seven days after the beginning of the period. Menopausal women, fix up a date every month and do it on the same date. Pregnant women, same date each month. Takes only about 20 minutes. Perform at least once a month. Examine whole of the breast tissue as well as the underarm area. And do it in front of the mirror so you can pick up any abnormal change in shape, size or abnormal discharge or any lump in the breast. So why don't more women practice the breast self-examination? It's basically fear of unknown or because of embarrassment or they think they are young and will not get any abnormality, lack of knowledge and too busy or forgetfulness. So this covers the two main cancers in women, both cervical cancer and breast cancer, and the screening intended for the detection of early cancer and pre-cancer. So hopefully you will take uh, the important points as a take-home message. Thank you. Can we go on to the next one? Okay, moving on to the presentation on incontinence. Okay. Okay, that's fine. So, what is incontinence? It's an involuntary leakage of urine when you feel the urge to urinate when a patient strains on coughing or sneezing or even laughing. That is called urinary incontinence. So what are we going to do in this presentation is try to understand the problem, try to understand the anatomy of the female bladder and understand what happens with incontinence, how to diagnose this, and how, what are the methods available for treating it so that it prevents the social embarrassment. Incontinence is basically three types. One can feel incontinent when there is an involuntary leakage associated with any kind of exertion, mainly with coughing, sneezing or laughing. This is called stress incontinence. Urge incontinence is one where there is an involuntary leakage of urine with an antecedent urgency or the irresistible urge to go and pass urine. Mixed incontinence is when the leakage associated with both the symptoms. So one can experience not only leakage related to the antecedent urgency, but also one experiences leakage when they cough, sneeze, or laugh. That's called mixed incontinence. Incontinence in women is actually a silent epidemic. You would be surprised to see that a lot more women who do not quite come forward with their symptoms do suffer from incontinence on a long-term basis only because they're too embarrassed to discuss this problem. It's a socially challenging issue, though not life-threatening, and they keep it quite secretive and only approach the doctor because they've had other problems or complications. How prevalent or how common is the problem? It is definitely much more common than we think. Nearly about in the cohort of population, stress incontinence nearly affects half of the women. 
the rest half is equally divided between urge incontinence and mixed incontinence. So this is to show the anatomy or the structure of the bladder. You can see in the picture the triangular portion is what we call the trigone and the pipe-like lower part is called the urethra. When there is a defective pelvic floor, the urethra releases or relaxes whereby when there is a cough, sneeze or laugh, there is an involuntary leakage of urine which we call the stress incontinence. The actual muscles which help support the urethra go around the urethra and the bladder neck in a form of a horseshoe and they help tighten that place so as to control the leakage of urine. So this is how the urethral sphincter manages to hold on to the urethra like a hammock and supports it from getting lax or getting depressed when there is a leakage due to a cough, sneeze or a laugh. So when a woman presents with incontinence, what are the important things we need to ask the women? I always tend to ask them about the urinary problems, especially whether they go to the loo very frequently, whether they, when they have the urge to go to the loo, do they leak even before reaching the restroom? Do they get up in the night frequently to use the restroom? Do they have pain during the voiding? Do they feel an incomplete sensation of voiding and have to wait there or put pressure on their tummy to completely void? Do they have any dribbling even after voiding? Do they involuntarily have leakage of urine when they cough, sneeze or laugh? And also a questionnaire about their bowel function, whether they are constipated, whether they have any difficulty in completely emptying the bowel and how badly this particular problem affects the quality of life. You would be surprised to see women have kept this quite secreted and many of them change the way they dress. The Indian sari or the attire is quite protective because it drapes you and people do not find it's the major problem. But if you wear Western clothing, it can be a problem and you need to attend to it quite significantly. It affects the quality of life and relevant Relevant medical history is also important. We need to get the history with regards to patient's weight, blood pressure. Are they, any on, are they on any diabetic medications or blood pressure medications, especially medications which we call diuretics because then the frequency of visit to the restroom will also increase. So when you get to the doctor with these problems, what does the doctor advise you to get? A urine analysis, mainly urine routine and a culture. A maintenance of a bladder diary, which is basically to assess how much fluid you're taking and, and a pack test. And also a test called uroflowmetry. What it involves is they will ask you to come on a full bladder, make you sit on a commode, which is attached to a computer, and void. And the computer will measure how much urine you've voided how much is retained inside, whether the flow rate is okay. And they might perform certain tests called systometry. I will show you pictures of that. And an ultrasound to look at the kidneys and the bladder capacity as well. So how do we diagnose incontinence? Basically by asking simple questions in history, like I told you, whether there is an involuntary leakage of urine when you cough, sneeze, or laugh. A vaginal examination to detect any pelvic organ prolapse. A stress test, as I said, we make the patient cough or strain and we look for any involuntary leakage. And we combine the physical test along with the Euroflow as well as the Eurodynamics. So the tests are used for a log of reasons, basically for the diagnosis. And also when we have monitoring patients on medical treatment, we need to know whether the bladder capacity is improved whether they are able to empty the bladder fully or whether the treatment is working or not. And also to find out whether this person will respond to the treatment adequately and also to plan for the treatment. So 
What do we do in physical examination when a patient presents with incontinence? We rule out pelvic organ prolapse or dryness of the vagina, which can happen due to menopause and lack of hormones. We also examine the voiding diary. This is a simple log of what we ask the woman to keep before seeing us. Ask the woman to take a record of the amount of water intake from 6 a.m. this morning to 6 a.m. next day morning. So over a 24-hour period, if they jot down how much fluid they are taking, how many times they visited the restroom, and how much urine they have passed, and how many episodes of leakage they've had, this will give us a fair idea of various things. Number one, we'll be able to assess whether the woman is adequately drinking enough water. This I find a major problem, especially in working women, or women who've had other problems like incontinence, where they voluntarily tend to restrict the water intake. Restriction of water intake can be a serious issue, especially because it predisposes women to recurrent urinary tract infection, second to kidney stones. So we will be able to assess whether the woman is adequately taking enough water. When I mean water, it's plain water. It's not any aerated soft drinks or fruit juices. Aerated soft drinks irritate the bladder, make you go to the loo very frequently, but actually leave you dehydrated. And fruit juices, because of the high sugar content, can do the same. So these are not equivalent to make a plain water as these can be dehydrated. To give you a rough idea of how much is adequate water intake, a 20 kilogram person needs one liter of water. So if you're 60 kilograms, you need three liters of water per day. That is the rough rule of thumb. So we also use and do an assessment to rule out any infection or blood in the urine, which can be done by a simple urine test and also demonstration of the stress incontinence when I ask the patient to cough or strain. So, as a urogynecologist, I tend to do what we call the urodynamics. This is the suite where we do the urodynamic testing in patients who have incontinence problem. And this is the couch where they be able to lie down and we monitor the pressures and find out what is wrong in the bladder. These are the catheters we put in. It's a painless procedure. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes. You would have a recorded computerized printout of the results on the same day and the doctor will be able to advise you of what treatment method should be followed. These are some of the graphs which come out from the computer when you have this particular test. And this shows when the woman is asked to cough straight, there is a leak noted there. That confirms stress urinary incontinence. This is a patient where the bladder is being filled and you can see the bladder pressure rising and a leak demonstrated. This person has got an unstable bladder or bladder which is irritable and acting of its own accord and these patients particularly complain of increasing frequent visits to the loo as well as when they have this urge to pass urine, they leak even before they reach the restroom. This is called urge incontinence. These are two different types of problems, two different types of pathologies, two different types of treatments, so they cannot be confused, which is why this test is very, very important to find what is the exact problem. Um, I think this is kind of a bit higher end in terms of uh, technique. So what are the treatments which are available? When I said about stress incontinence, remember the leakage one can have due to cough or laughing or sneezing. It is usually related to the muscle support around the urethra. The pelvic floor muscle training, what famously known as the Kegels exercises, are very helpful in prevention or worsening of the problem. If you already have stress incontinence, it will not correct it or it will not make it go away. What it can do, it can prevent it from getting worse. So I recommend pelvic floor muscle training to all women, irrespective of whether they have incontinence or do not, that they do it on a regular basis 
every day, twice a day, throughout their life to prevent incontinence later on in their lifetime. If this alone doesn't work, we combine what we call biofeedback and electrical stimulation, which can be done in the physiotherapy department. You do not need to come every day. You come once a week, learn the exercises, and we can assess the effect of the exercises on a weekly basis for a period of about six to eight weeks. And we also use what are called rings or pessaries, which can support the pelvic floor around the urinary opening so that the stress incontinence does not happen. Not all women are suitable for such non-surgical methods. Young women who have still not completed the family, women during pregnancy because of the weight of the abdomen who experience stress incontinence, or women who are in their early 30s will not be suitable for surgery because they're very young, these methods can be tried. Or even in elderly women, when they have attendant problems, when they are not fit for surgery, can have these done. But not all of them are suitable for the non-surgical methods. So what we have for surgical method is to recreate the urethral support, just to make sure that is adequate support to the pelvic floor to prevent the involuntary leakage of urine. We can either do it through the tummy or through the vagina by supporting the urethra so that there is no leakage when there is cough, strain, or laughing. So, there are definite improvements in women with a small amount of leakage or with significant comorbidities. So, we use various types of slings which go around the urethra, just like tying a shoelace on tightening the area so that there is no further leakage. This is just to show what exactly the surgery involves. The first picture on the left shows a bladder and the urethra. And the second picture on the top, on the right, the, uh, shows you the three sutures which go around from the area around the urethra to the bone which support the area around the urethra, thereby preventing any leakage. The bottom right one is the one procedure which we use regularly nowadays because it's a keyhole surgery and does not cause major problems for the patient. This is just to show the anatomy for many people who do not understand this. This is the urinary opening and we have, I have shown you where the bladder neck is. We place the tape exactly mid position between the urethral opening and the bladder neck. This is how the tape will go through and this will tighten it like a shoelace so that there is no leakage of urine when there is an increasing cough or stress. This is just to show where the tape is placed like an animation. So this is how the tape goes on an animation. We have various introducers to put the tape in. This is a permanent tape. So at the end of the procedure, this is how the tape will be supporting the bladder neck. As you can see, when there is a cough or sneeze, the bladder neck doesn't come down and is well supported by the tape which acts like a hammock. It's a day surgery procedure. It's hardly 20 minutes. It can be done under IV sedation. Requires one to two weeks of work. Very rare to have major complications and the efficacy of this procedure is very good in terms of the success rate. What do we mean by success in an incontinence surgery? A person who used to get wet, wear pads or continuous leakage will become dry after the surgical procedure. So this is just to show you the success rates. For women who are not good candidates for surgery, especially women who are very elderly, who had multiple vaginal births, who are obese, we inject around the urethra to make the area thicker so that they do not leak. But this doesn't have that good a success rate as compared to the tape surgery. So it is a very common problem in women. 
it does need conservative treatment initially or in women who are not suitable for surgery. However, if you needed surgery, it is a quick surgery, which is done as a day case. You do not need to get admitted into the hospital. It has a quicker recovery. It's very little risk compared to a very good outcome and success of surgery. So why do you get incontinence? This is just a summary for people who went through the whole presentation. You can get it because of an irritable bladder, because of a weak bladder neck, because of weak pelvic muscle, or because of an overflow or nerve-related problems, especially due to road traffic accidents, which involve the spinal cord, a fall of a bike, or when you have had a road traffic accident. When do you get incontinence? When women who have had repeated vaginal deliveries, a forceps delivery, when you've had a prolonged labor for more than 14, 15 hours, women who are asthmatic, who are overweight, who are diabetic, who have had a bladder neck blockage or spinal disorders or cerebral problems, especially elderly women who have had a stroke or what we call Parkinson's disease, can be predisposed to having incontinence. Why is it important? It's important because it's a question of personal hygiene. It can leave you very socially embarrassed if you have repeated episodes of wetting. There is a risk of fall because of the need to go to the loo very urgently or you might leak on the way. Urinary tract infections are common with incontinence and repeated urinary tract infection can damage your kidneys. It can leave you very depressed because it is a big blow on the self-morale and self-esteem. So when do you see a specialist? If you have everyday leak episodes, if you keep visiting the washroom very frequently, if you need to wear diapers um, because of the incontinence, if you have to get up in the night to frequently use the washroom and it is disturbing your sleep, when there is a burning sensation of pain when you pass urine, when you leak on cough, sneeze or laugh, when you have incontinence of the bowels as well associated or when there is something coming down the vagina in the form of a prolapse, you definitely need to see a specialist. So whom to see? You see a person who is an expert in urogyny or probably female urologist. So what do you expect during such a consultation? They will take a very detailed history of the episodes of urination, detailed abdominal and internal examination, as I told you, they will do this Euroflow or the systematic test. They will do a urine routine and a culture. They'll advise you regarding reduction of weight if you're overweight and strict control of the diabetes and alter the medications of blood pressure, especially if you're on a diuretic. And they will give you an instruction of filling a bladder diary whereby we can assess whether there is an adequate intake of water or what is causing the incontinence. What happens next? You will be referred to a physiotherapy department and advice will be given regarding pelvic floor exercises, lifestyle advice mainly with regards to reduction of weight, control of diabetes, avoid lifting heavy weights, avoiding aerated food, uh, soft drinks, avoiding excess coffee or tea, and what we called timed voiding. You will be asked to visit the washroom based on the clock rather than based on your wish to visit the washroom. So if you have a three to four hour interval between voids, that is a healthy bladder habit. So if somebody has got the habit of frequently visiting the washroom, by doing so, the bladder shrinks in size and can become a problem perennially. To avoid this, we do what is called a bladder drill by exercising and stretching the bladder to its maximum capacity. For that, you have to ignore the signals the brain is telling you to go to the bathroom. Try to control and postpone it for every three to four hours so you can allow the bladder muscle to stretch to its maximum capacity, thereby you preventing worsening of the incontinence in the long run. So what are the ways you could get treated? You will have advice regarding fluid intake, bladder retraining. The doctor will prescribe some oral medications pelvic floor exercises, or a possible need of surgery, which I mentioned, the tape surgery, earlier on. What are the side effects you can anticipate when you take these medications? It can cause dry mouth, it can cause constipation, 
dry eyes and drowsiness, so you might be advised to make sure you take adequate precautions while driving. So what are the complications of surgery? Majority are fine. One in 100 can develop difficulty in passing urine or risk of groin pain. But however, the overall success rate is about 85 to 95 percent. What does the surgery involve? It is a placement of a proline tape underneath the urethra to act as a hammock for the bladder neck. It supports and prevents leak, sits in the vaginal wall without excess tension, can be done under local or anesthesia or GA. It can be done as a day case. The total cost will be about 80000 including the tape cost. So what is the aftercare? You will not have a catheter in most of the cases. You can walk back home. You should avoid lifting heavy weights and sitting on the floor. After two days of normal, after two days of recovery, you can resume normal activity. It involves quicker recovery, no stitches on the outside. Some may need antibiotics, and the doctor will review you in a couple of weeks to see how you're getting on. There is a particular injection which we give in certain patients who have not responded well to medications known as the Botox. So for people who think it's only for beauty and for wrinkles, no, it can be used for bladder and incontinence problem as well. It has a fantastic effect which lasts longer than the medication. We do not need to use any medications or diapers or other problems for up to a year and subsequently, if you need, can have a repeat injection. In women who've had a bladder outlet block, we relieve the block, just like a kitchen pipe getting blocked with rust. We put a brush and clean it. Similar to that, the bladder block can be corrected by putting a camera through, an endoscope through, and opening up the passage. Anything else you want to know, we'll feel free to take the questions. because of the request. Um, shall I minimize this? Hmm. This is yet another common problem. Okay. This is something on polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. You might have heard of this. It's the most common endocrine disorder in women of reproductive age. In South India, it will be more than 20%. In the Caucasian population, less than 10%. So many Asian women are predisposed to the development of PCOS. It's a triad of having irregular periods or no periods, being overweight and excess facial hair. So, we're basically going to look into how they present with symptoms, how we diagnose, what are the potential causes, what are the implications or complications of having a PCOS at an early stage, and how does it affect fertility. This is the most prevalent gynecological or medical condition in women. You can see these women going to various specialities, right from the dermatologist for their skin problems, acne, hair fall down to the infertility specialist or a diabetologist for abnormal blood sugars and infertility problems. It is likely to have a lifelong impact on the patient, but it is treatable, it is controllable. Patients with PCOS have multiple symptoms. They present with endocrine or hormonal problems. They present with gynecological, mainly period-related problems. They present with obstetrical problems, basically because of the blood sugars of pregnancy, they can become diabetic at a very early age. They can have skin problems. The main skin problem is excess acne, excess facial hair, hair fall, and balding. 
and eating disorder because of their being overweight and also psychological problems such as depression and anxiety. Magnitude of the problem, as I mentioned earlier, nearly one-fifth of the women in South India are known to have polycystic ovaries. Basically, in South, uh, sub, uh, South Asian population, nearly about 50%, Northwest of India has a very high rate of polycystic ovarian disease. It affects 5 to 10% of women in the reproductive age group. It is a major cause of infertility where the ovaries do not ovulate. And major cause of hirsutism. Hirsutism is the excess facial hair growth and acne. It is definitely linked with type 2 diabetes and likely to become one of the major health care issues in the future due to its long-term sequelae and its complications. It has a wide range of presentation, which is why there is a problem with the proper treatment and diagnosis. So, what exactly it is? It is a syndrome basically associated with prop, improper functioning of the ovaries. That leads to excess male hormones in the body and that predisposes to the change in the picture of the ovaries as studied on ultrasound. It is just not an ultrasound diagnosis. On the converse, you do not have need to have an ultrasound to detect polycystic ovaries or Appearance of polycystic ovaries on ultrasound does not necessarily mean you suffer from the disease. You need to have either abnormal periods or irregular cycle or no periods with evidence of male hormone excess in the body to make a clinical diagnosis of polycystic ovaries. The underlying problem is not due to the ovary or due to the hormones. The underlying problem is what we call imbalance due to insulin resistance. Now, to explain this further, all of us secrete insulin. It comes from an organ called pancreas and all of us have this hormone in the body. When insulin becomes deficient, we develop diabetes. Insulin is very essential for proper control of sugars in your blood. Now, certain women, especially of South Indian origin, due to the genetic predisposition, due to the strong family history of diabetes, and also to the excess carbohydrate in your daily staple diet, especially related to rice, we tend to secrete more insulin than what is actually required. This insulin is not well utilized by the body tissue, and thereby, over time, more and more insulin is secreted in response to a meal every time you eat. In a short span of time, say 10 to 20 years, all this insulin becomes depleted and by the age of 30 or 40, you're left without insulin in the body, which is when you become diabetic. So we need to pick out the problem at a much early stage when excess insulin is being pumped out in response to a meal. This is classically seen in adolescent teenagers when they are obese. They have this craving attitude to food. They have a lot of what we call sweet tooth. When you see the fasting blood sugar will be higher than the blood sugars which are taken after a meal. This is because in response to the meal, there is too much insulin pumped out into the bloodstream. So the sugar level drops very quickly. And these teenagers tend to get hungry much more quicker they start eating within two hours of their previous meal and they nibble on snacks or junk food. That's because of the insulin resistance in the body. If this is not corrected, then that leads on to diabetes at a much early stage. And it is because of this condition, it is associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular events. So... We do see both ends of polycystic ovaries, women who ovulate and women who have stopped producing any egg. So a third of the women with PCOS will have no periods. Nearly about four-fifths of them will have irregular periods or scanty periods. And many of them will present with infertility. And PCO can also be found, as I told you, in ultrasound in one-fifth of normal women. So do not panic if you find an ultrasound diagnosis of polycystic ovaries. It does not necessarily mean you have the disease. It's just the way the ovaries are looking on ultrasound.
it has a genetic predisposition. If your mother, your grandmother, or your sisters had polycystic ovaries, there is a chance you will develop polycystic ovaries as well. And if you're an identical twin, there is more than twice the chance that you will also have polycystic ovaries. So nowadays, we detect what is called an anti-Mullerian hormone, which we essentially use for the polycystic ovaries, especially in women undergoing fertility treatment. This tends to predict how successful the fertility treatment is going to be in a woman with polycystic ovaries. So what are the symptoms? As I told you, you develop irregular periods. You have excess hormones, male hormones in the body, and that can present as excessive hair growth, increased weight, acne, and infertility. This is the appearance you will get. As you can see, around the ovary, there is an arrangement of the follicles which appear like the pearl necklace appearance. The underlying problem, as I mentioned earlier, is insulin resistance. It's genetic predisposition, aging, drugs, and lifestyle. It leads to uh, excess insulin in the body and thereby leads to acne or hysteticism or fertility problems. So first degree relatives of patients with polycystic ovaries will be at higher risk of developing sugar related problems in the future and mothers and sisters of polycystic ovary patients do have higher levels of hormones in the bloodstream as well. And 50% of the polycystic ovarian disease patients are obese. So you do not need to be overweight to be diagnosed with polycystic ovaries. Even patients who are thin can be diagnosed with polycystic ovaries. What are the implications in terms of long term? We know that if you have polycystic ovaries which are uncorrected, there is a higher risk of developing uterine cancer. And it's a higher disease of developing coronary artery disease and heart attacks because of the cardiovascular risk due to the polycystic ovaries. Women have increased sleep disordered breathing and daytime sleepiness, especially if they are overweight and also have polycystic ovaries. We also know that there is a higher incidence of depression, especially in obese women, because of the greater insulin resistance. What are the pregnancy complications if a woman with polycystic ovaries becomes pregnant? There can be an increased association with abortions because of the overweight in these patients, or they can become diabetic during pregnancy or have an impaired glucose tolerance test have developed blood pressure during pregnancy or can give birth to babies which are smaller than the average weight. More than 75% of these women with polycystic ovaries will have infertility, will have difficulty in conceiving and will need treatment for getting pregnant. That is basically because there is a stoppage of the ovulation or egg release which is the primary factor determining how fertile the woman is. If the fertility is hampered, then there is a delay in conception or the woman will warrant treatment for conception. And if you treat them, they hyper respond to all the hormones which are given for fertility treatment and they are at higher risk of developing more than a twin pregnancy if not properly monitored. So what is the weight loss uh, issue in polycystic ovaries? Frequency of being overweight in women, especially in women who do not have periods, is about 75%. And they tend to use lose more weight compared to the average controls because of the alteration in the insulin resistance. So the primary advice for polycystic ovaries would be to go on a weight loss program, either a tailor-made one or you can adapt your own one by a calorie-restricted diet sugar-free diet or what we call a low glycemic index diet and go for regular exercises for nearly about 30 to 45 minutes every day at least five days in a week. So fertility treatment you can go from the least which is needed in terms of clomiphene drugs or to the maximum of having a test tube baby or an IVF. 
And as I told you earlier, they respond very drastically to the hormones and thereby have a higher risk of having a twin pregnancy, which is why they are more prone to complications. We have various challenges when polycystic ovaries present to us, especially adolescent teenagers who are overweight, who are not getting regular periods, or adolescent teenagers who have continuous bleeding during periods for nearly a month or month and a half. We have women seeking contraception. We have women with polycystic ovaries coming to us for metabolic problems like being overweight, having high cholesterol levels, having impaired glucose levels, who are developed diabetes and pregnancy, and so on and so forth. Or women trying to get pregnant, or if they got pregnant, they would have miscarried because of the polycystic ovaries. And in the long term, we need to keep an eye on these women because they are at higher risk of developing diabetes, of developing cardiovascular problems, developing high cholesterol levels, as well as uterine cancers. So how do we treat these women? First will be lifestyle issue, reduction in weight, calorie restricted diet, and making sure they exercise and adapt a healthy lifestyle with an exercise of about 30 to 45 minutes, medium to high intensity every day. We also use metformin. Now, the common myth is that metformin is used only in diabetic. No, it is a major important drug which is used in polycystic ovaries because the underlying problem is the same. As I told you earlier, the insulin resistance then makes you predisposed to diabetes. So we're correcting the problem at the root cause level rather than leaving it too late before it becomes diabetes. So metformin is a major drug uh, it comes under the brand name of glycomet, glycophage. Many of you would have seen your parents or uh, family members taking this for diabetes. It is the mainstay for treatment of the polycystic ovaries. Vitamin D. Vitamin D supplementation is very, very, very essential in women to correct various hormonal imbalances which can happen due to polycystic ovaries. It would be surprising in spite of excess sunshine in our Indian subcontinent. Indian women, nearly about 80 to 90 percent are vitamin D deficient because they do not expose them adequately to sunlight, sunlight, either because they wear protective clothing or wear gloves when riding a two-wheeler or have sunscreens. So there is not enough vitamin D produced in the skin. The only natural source of vitamin D is sunlight. And the only area which produces vitamin D in your body is your skin. When sunlight touches the skin, there are chemical changes in the skin which produce vitamin D, which then gets to the liver. If this doesn't happen, no vitamin D is produced. And vitamin D production happens only for half an hour. So even if you burn yourself in sunlight for more than 12 hours, you're not going to get enough D, what is more than required for about half an hour. So if you're vitamin D deficient, then there is a higher incidence of being overweight or having abnormal hormone problems. So vitamin D is very, very essential in treatment of polycystic ovaries. So in conclusion, polycystic ovarian disease is a multifaceted condition. It presents from anything uh, from being having irregular periods to having uterine cancer. It begins much early in your age in the adolescent teenage. It has long-term consequences, both genetic and pregnancy-related implications. It is a metabolic disorder. It presents with cosmetic challenges. It can end up with reproductive complications and even cancer. Thank you. So the first question, does cyst in the ovary cause cancer? No, cyst in the ovary doesn't cause cancer, but a cyst in the ovary after the age of menopause should be made sure it is not cancer. So anything about five centimeters could be a cancer. Anything less than five centimeters, you do some hormone tests as well as a scan to find out if there are any changes suggestive of cancer and follow it up. Up to what age can cervical cancer immunization be given? Ideally, before your first childbirth. Ideally. 
because after that once you've had there is no point in giving this because the protection offered is not great so the ideal recommended age would be between 12 and 25 so I combine it with the uh, MMR booster dose which I give to adolescent teenagers and the best target population would be uh, high school goers and college students in Chennai where can we take the immunization shall we go to the gynecologist and which hospital all gynecologists do the immunization for cervical cancer it is known as Garda cell vaccine it's done in three doses there are no major side effects you do not need to take time off work or school or college you just appear for an injection first dose now second dose in two months third dose in six months and no fever associated with it or pain in the area of the injection no known complications okay since mammogram does not really identify 100 percent of breast cancer which other diagnosis i should undergo my mother has breast cancer and i'm diabetic um, Yes, mammogram does not identify 100% cancer, but is the best method available for screening. If you combine breast self-examination as well as mammogram on a yearly basis, the chances of missing cancer are few. So I would recommend self-examination and mammogram on a yearly basis. Breast self-examination on a monthly basis. If one tries to control bladder, will it not lead to urinary tract infection? If you control the bladder for more than four hours, yes. There are women who have this habit of never voiding in travel. So they postpone the voiding for about eight, 10 hours. That will cause urinary tract infection. But going every hour will make your bladder weak. So if you try and control the bladder for about three to four hours, which is the maximum, that will be okay. Is PCOS associated with thyroid? I'm eight months pregnant. I have PCOS for past five years and I've developed pregnancy thyroid recently. Because it is a hormonal problem, the thyroid deficiency can become associated with PCOS. But PCOS does not necessarily cause thyroid problems. And it's quite common thyroid problems as well. One in three women do have underactive thyroid. Especially we pick that up in adolescent teenagers when you're pregnant or during delivery and during menopause. When somebody is having irregular periods at a frequency of two to three months, does it mean she has PCOS? Most probably, yes. Especially if you're overweight. So, answer is yes. Participants, the doctor is ready to answer your questions. Please send your questions. My daughter is 30 years. Can she take the cervical cancer immunization? Not much of a benefit, but no harm in taking. I strongly wouldn't recommend it. Best to stick to pap smear every three years. And she gets married in the middle will there be a problem no if she's not married give it to her no um, i would avoid this in pregnancy so she completes the course completely within six months yes that's fine in such case is it necessary for the person to go for surgery which case Which means if you have irregular periods, do you need surgery? No. Polycystic ovaries does not mean you have big cysts on the ovary. It just means you have irregular hormones. So you don't need surgery for polycystic ovaries. No. If you're overweight, you need to lose weight and get an active lifestyle. That itself will correct the problem.
this to the front. She won't breastfeed the baby. Okay, the question is um, not breastfed the baby and has polycystic ovaries, now slight breast pain. Breast self-examination, get the examination of breast done by the gynecologist and if she is more than 35, she can have a mammogram. But breast pain, very unlikely to be breast cancer. Breast pain is due to hormonal imbalance and can be easily treated with vitamin E type of preparation. Does not necessarily mean cancer. I wouldn't recommend mammogram below the age of 35 because it can irradiate the breast and irradiation of the breast itself can be a risk factor for developing breast cancer. Okay, the same question. As I told earlier, the cervical cancer vaccine can be given up to the age of marriage. Yes, your daughter can have the immunization. It is better to have the immunization complete before the pregnancy. So she cannot, if she gets pregnant, she cannot continue the immunization during pregnancy. That is the answer. Slide down. Yeah. Most welcome. Participants, please type in your questions and send it to us. of frequent urination while laughing she's age 55 menopause yes she should take the incontinence test she should see the urogynecologist get examined and find out what is causing the stress incontinence definitely yes Procedure for self-breast examination, 
stand in front of a mirror, especially after seven days of a period, if you're menopausal, first of every month, examine the whole breast, examine the nipples, examine the underarms. Feel for any lumps, feel for any skin changes or any areas of tenderness. If that is so, head back to your gynecologist for an examination and a mammogram. That's what we need to do. It should be done in front of a mirror. Pelvic floor muscle training is basically tightening your pelvic floor muscles, especially around the birth passage, around 10 to 12 times every day, twice a day. It can be done when you're sat down, when you're watching television, when you're cooking, when you're teaching your children, anytime. Imagine there is a lemon inside the vagina and you're trying to squeeze the vaginal muscle to hold the lemon higher up without releasing it. That's exactly the action you need to do for pelvic muscle training. Hold it till a count of 10, relax. Hold it for a count of 10, relax. Such reps for about 10 times in the morning and 10 times in the night would be the thing you need to do for pelvic floor training. To facilitate this, have a cushion in between your thighs and try and squeeze it without using your thigh muscles. That will be proper training for your pelvic floor. The next question, now that I've lost weight due to pregnancy thyroid, does it mean that my baby will also be underweight? No. Baby doesn't have uh, any relation to the pregnancy-related thyroid. will be okay. Standard food habits for PCOS, avoid any sugary substances, avoid too much carbohydrate, take plenty of fruit and veg, millets or millet based diet would be better because that has a low glycemic index. There is something called low GI diet, which I meant by low glycemic index, which is very good for polycystic ovaries. Um, avoid bakery items, avoid processed foods or tinned foods because they have a high sugar content and salt content. So these are the food recommended habits for polycystic ovaries. Depends on what topic also.
baby and I have thyroid problem, please suggest me for the same as already. Okay, it's a very relevant question. Anybody with a thyroid problem usually has an underactive thyroid. When somebody has an underactive thyroid, they measure three things, the T3, T4, TSH. When somebody has underactive thyroid, TSH will be high. That means your brain is telling the thyroid to secrete enough hormones, but the thyroid gland is not able to, and therefore the TSH is high. So we give the thyroid hormone tablet every day on an empty stomach on a daily basis to correct the TSH level. Now this has to be taken lifelong. You cannot stop these medications. And if you have the doctor telling you to repeat the test, the TSH in three months or six, time, six months time, it is with a view to see whether the dose can be titrated depending upon the TSH level. For example, if you have a TSH level of seven, you will need the thyroid hormone at a dosage of 50 or 75 microgram. In three months time, if your thyroid TSH level comes down to three, which is normal, you will be continued on the same dosage. Say if it went to 12, you will be asked to increase the dosage. If it became less than one, you will ask, be asked to reduce the dosage. So the reason why we ask you to repeat the TSH and if it became normal, please do not stop the medication, continue on the same dose. Because the moment you stop, your body will go back to the original and your TSH will rise. This is a lifelong medication. And if you are detected to have pregnancy, increase the dose by 25 because in the first three months when the baby's nervous system is being formed, you need a higher dose of thyroxine hormone so that the baby's neural development is adequately taken care of. So if you are on a 50 microgram, you need to increase the dosage to a 75 microgram the moment you miss a period and pregnancy test is confirmed and go to your doctor as soon as the pregnancy test is positive. Hope that answers your question. range of TSH in this time of pregnancy? Very good question. Any pregnant woman in the first trimester, the TSH should be less than 2.5. So what in the non-pregnant state does not apply to pregnancy? So less than 2.5 is normal TSH in the first trimester. If it is higher, you need to increase the dose even higher. Thyroxine tablets do not cause side effects if they are prescribed for underactive thyroid. If you do not take them, your body slows down significantly. Uh, no, to explain it very in a layman term, uh, a body without thyroxine is like a machine without oil. Everything is uh, creaky and slow. 
So everything slows down. The metabolism slows down. So if you have thyroxine in the body in an adequate time uh, dosage, that will be good for the body. If it is inadequate, everything will be slow. What type of diet should I take? Uh, thyroid problem is not necessarily diet related. Of course, there are parts in India, especially like Salem, Erod, um, Himalayan territory, where there are people with reduced iodine intake in the soil or the salt who develop thyroid deficiency. However, most of the thyroid problems are genetic. If your family, any member has had thyroid deficiency, you are at higher risk of developing thyroid problem during your lifetime. But you can avoid certain substances to prevent further thyroid deficiency, like the cauliflower cabbage. Uh, things like these have substances which in, within them which inhibit the thyroid hormone. So avoiding excess usage of cabbage and cauliflower will prevent your thyroid deficiency becoming worse. There is nothing to prevent it. Of course, taking iodized salt for people who are deficient in that area is good. But avoiding these two will prevent further deficiency happening. You don't need to avoid them, but don't take them daily. Before planning pregnancy, does the thyroid patient needs to consult a doctor? I think that is quite advisable because once you can check your TSH, you can go on a high dose folic acid and make sure you also increase your thyroid uh, tablet if needed. So I think it is necessary.
Yes, uh, you've had polycystic for past five years, pregnant now. Did you have difficulty in conceiving? And the best way to prevent a polycystic ovaries post-pregnancy is to maintain adequate uh, exercise, active lifestyle, and avoid uh, putting weight on. And if you follow that, there won't be any difficulty in conceiving for the second time. Hope that answers your query. Participants, any more questions? The very fact you didn't need to take any medication for your first baby uh, shows probably your polycystic ovaries was not that bad. So that itself is encouraging that you might not have con difficulty in conceiving, especially if your weight is under control. Uh, dals are not uh, uh, harmful for any diabetic or thyroid, no. Hello. What Participants, two more minutes to send your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. That was indeed a very useful session. Thank you, participants. <laughs>